the city named after my favorite French actor, Jean Reno, but a little secret, nobody knows that at all. Uh, I dedicate this talk to the memory of a esteemed and devoted the BBC member, um, Jack Stout of the Chicago uh, group. Uh, many of us met uh, Jack on, Jan uh, on June 15, 1980 at the second PPC conference in Chicago and Jack brought a big white van to the uh, O'Hare airport to pick us up and we went to Ace Metal and then I think we went to his house and we did that over the years. He, in fact, the last 10 years he hosted the, one of our HHC conferences at uh, Ace Metal and uh, we are appreciative of his generosity and uh, friendship and we will always uh, remember that fondly. Uh, my personal creed when I look at technology and algorithm is uh, borrowed from Voltaire who said in French, le meilleur est l'ennemi du bien. Uh, the better is the enemy of the good. I'm not sure if Voltaire would be an HHC member and collect all these. He may just sell, sell off slightly older versions and keep the, the new stuff, but uh, we'll never know. Uh, when we look at the uh, legacy numerical analysis algorithms, stuff that goes a couple of centuries old, we notice that they are simple and, and straight to the point. They were typically performed by human calculators, people who worked for the esteemed mathematicians and did cranked out all the stuff by hand. Uh, so there was a big incentive to keep these algorithms as simple as possible. Uh, remember, humans made more errors. They were not always reliable. And you can only imagine that somebody had to go back and check on the numbers if the results looked funny. Uh, so when HP launched the first programmable calculators, the 65, followed by the 55, 25, they had limited memory, limited number of registers, and they seemed ideal to implement many of the legacy algorithms. It was almost like a perfect match. Of course, at that time, many people had sporadic access to uh, the mainframes at the university at work, but it was limited access. So these machines brought uh, uninterrupted, extended access to computing devices. And then the second generation came with the advent of the 41. It had more memory, more registers, uh, you know, ma better mass storage, plug-in ROMs. So things got to move and to be uh, uh, more more interesting. At the same time, at the end of the 70s, early 80s, uh, Apple and IBM you know, were selling their computers, and of course, these machines brought more memory, more power, better display, better mass storage, and uh, somewhat easier to, pr uh, easier to read a programming language like BASIC and eventually uh, Pascal. So the outcome is we got spoiled. We went from programming in the machines with limited resources and we would count the bytes and squeeze in as much as we can to, uh, you know, things didn't have to be that, you, you know, as long as the, the program worked, we were fine. And we began to, even then, to think, and it's a slow process, admittedly, to think of a more multi-step algorithms. And, uh, you know, we were not tied anymore to slow machines, limited memories. Some of the example of the multi-step algorithms, actually one of the older ones, is the Runge-Kata numerical integration method. And if you play with that stuff, you know that in each iteration there are some intermediate values that they calculate to refine the in integral at the end of that one step. Uh, uh, Ostrowski, the Russian uh, mathematician in the last century, developed a root-seeking algorithm where he did two refinements for the root in each iteration. And he was able to achieve speeds comparable to Halley's method, which was superior to Newton's method. So that was interesting. Uh, as I researched the, sub the subject, you know, I've noticed recent Chinese and Middle Eastern mathematicians developing even more sophisticated uh, multi-step uh, methods and uh, uh, to calculate the root of nonlinear functions. and. They came out with like each iteration had three or more refinements for the root. And as a result, the number of iterations did drop like they wanted, but the number of function calls 
kind of skyrocketed. And so in the end, I, when I look at all these methods, maybe something like Ostrowski or Haley is optimum between number of iterations and keeping the number of function calls uh, low. When we look at the bisection method, uh, well, officially is the slowest uh, root-seeking method. Uh, about a month ago, I devised one even slower, but it was just <laughs> just for the fun of it. And it was, it was very simple, but it is slower than the bisection. Anyway, the method uh, systematically shrinks the root bracketing uh, interval, call it uh, AB, by cutting it in half, so, you know. And basically, this process hugs the root, shrinks the interval until you make it so small, just barely around the root, and then that would be the refined guess that you would accept. Uh, this method is guaranteed to work if uh, the initial condition, f of a times f of b, is uh, zero or uh, uh, negative. Uh, the method is mentioned in the typically most numerical analysis books purely for historical reasons. So, uh, anyway, of course, Mr. Kiraski here said, can we enhance this algorithm and put it on, on some steroids? And I'm happy to say, yes, we can. But of course, not everybody shares my, uh, my enthusiasm. Some people in the past are st still stuck in the past. Sorry, Carl. Uh, I will present two variants of the bisection method. The first one is the bisection plus. Now, each iteration in the, this new algorithm uh, calculates the mid midpoint, call it x1, and calculates the function value. This is just like the bisection, nothing different so far. But the second step, here's where the bisection plus does it differently. It then calculates a slope intercept passing through x1 on the curve with either a or b. Now, which one? The method selects the interval endpoint whose function value has the opposite sign of, x of f of x1. Why? Uh, because it wants to ensure that the point uh, x1, f of x1, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the new point lies in the interval um, AB. If we shoot outside, then we lose the guarantee for convergence. Here's a, a diagram uh, for the algorithm. X1 is the midpoint, and here I have f of X1 happens to be negative, same sign as uh, f of A. So I connect X1 on the curve, with B on the curve, and I calculate X2. And then I look at the value of X2. If these two match, then my new interval is X2, B. But if F of X2 matches F of B in its sign, then the new interval is X1, X2. Now, the reason why I'm choosing opposite, because that was a simple uh, monotonic function, but here it's not. And if I was tempted to take the the endpoint with the smaller absolute value, suppose that value was here, then if I connect x1 on the curve with b on the curve, I draw a line there and I'm outside the interval. Bad news. So, uh, again, here uh, I calculate x2 and a, a better estimate for the root than x1, and then uh, I determine which part of the, uh, make sure that it lies in the interval, uh, a and b, and I calculate f of x2. So each iteration ends up with the original interval values at uh, a, b, and uh, two new values, x1, the midpoint, and the interpolated point, x2. Uh, now we need to shrink the root, and this involves uh, two tests. I look at the values of uh, f of x1 and f of x2. If I, if I multiply them and get a negative number, then x1, x2, replaces A and B, and this will cause a rapid shrinking in the uh, root bracketing interval. But if the product is not, uh, is positive, then um, I check, for example, F of A times F of X2 to determine which of A or B will be replaced by X2. The method is simple. Interesting to point that we do calculate a, a, a slope, a line in the, in the process. Now, this is different than Newton's because Newton's calculate the slope at the guess, at the tangent. And if the tangent is low, 
then Newton's method risk for shooting way to the left or to the right and maybe not even ever dive, uh, converging. That's not the case uh, in the bisection plus. It's, you will always guarantee convergence. Uh, this is a screenshot for HP prime. Uh, I have my favorite function e to the x minus 3x squared. And uh, I have a function called bis plus that takes a and b, the root bracketing uh, interval, and I give it a tolerance. And here I call it, I give it 3 to 5 with a small value for the tolerance. And I get uh, the root near 3.733. Uh, this is a table, one of uh, many tables you'll see similar ones where I'm comparing a test case for uh, first column shows the various functions. Second column shows the root initial root bracketing interval. Third column shows the tolerance value. And then the fourth column has the root that I expect to get. The last two columns are interesting. It can, they show the number of iterations and number of function calls. And here I squeeze the various algorithms I'm comparing. So in this case, I have the bisection, bisection plus, and of course, Newton. Um, as you can see, if you study the, the, the table, bisection plus definitely is faster than the bisection. As far as how it stacks up with Newton, uh, the results are mixed. Sometimes bisection plus does better. Sometimes uh, Newton uh, does better. Uh, the second variant on the bisection plus method, I call it the big bisection plus plus. If you programmed in C++, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it picks up where the bisection plus uh, leaves off. Now, if you remember in the bisection plus, uh, each iteration ends up with four points at uh, A, B, X1, and X2. So the bisection plus plus method says, uh, I'm going to use these points to perform an inverse quadratic Lagrangian interpolation to refine x2 and get a better uh, guess for the root. Now, since a quadratic interpolation requires three points and we have four, then we need to choose three of these four points and throw the fourth one out. And to do that, we have options going from simple to really all out uh, sophisticated stuff. The first version and the simplest one uh, uses x1 and x2 systematically, and then looks uh, chooses either A or B, depending on which of these two points has a smaller absolute function value. This version is simple to code. Yeah. Version 2 goes uh, relies the fact that we're using machines and not humans to do the operations. It maps the four values onto an array X and the four function values onto an array Y and then sorts these arrays in ascending order using the absolute values of y. And so the method then uh, picks up the first three points in the sorted array to perform the quadratic interpolation. Version 3 kind of takes a little steps back and does a little bit of cheating. It says, OK, I'm going to take all four points and do a cubic interpolation instead of a a quadratic interpolation. It's not that much more effort, and I don't have to do all that sorting thing and you know save time on that. So that works well. Version 4 is uh, way overkill, but I just put it here for fun, is you basically calculate the refined case at the midpoint, then use a linear, then quadratic, and then cubic. Obviously not an optimum method to uh, uh, for function calls and all that may get you there faster, but at a higher cost of the function calls. I just put it here for fun. Um, in either case, um, you will refine the uh, uh, guess uh, at x2 uh, and get a value called at 3. Here is something important. You have to make sure that x3 lies within the interval a, b before you replace x2 with x3. If not, that's not the case. Then you simply use x2. That, that's fine enough. And what you do at the end also, you check if the um, absolute value of fx2 is uh, less than some function tolerance value. If that's the case, then uh, you don't need to do uh, the iterations anymore. You stop, you have your, your uh, results. Here's again the uh, table for comparison. Uh, we have the first column, the function tested functions. Second column, the initial root bracketing interval. <coughs> 
Third column is a little bit different. We have the tolerance value and the function tolerance value because we have now two criteria to start the iterations. Third one is the root and then the last two, of course, the number of iterations and number of function calls and now I'm comparing bisection with bisection plus plus and Newton's method. And if you look at the, the table, clearly bisection plus does much better than Newton. And in that sense, I feel I've succeeded taking the slowest slug moving algorithm, give it a little bit of uh, additional, make it a multi-step and improve it over Newton's method that's been typically uh, a favorite of numerical analysis. So, uh, yes? When you do the testing, do you have favorite messy functions that you throw at it? No, no, I just uh, I have some favorite functions and try different things. Yeah, uh, but I tried like I've, I've, in the tables you can see I tried uh, some of these and then some polynomials and logarithms and course and so I use different categories of functions rather than specific known to be messy and and giving other methods troubles. No, I mean I don't expect it to be. Uh, the pinball wizard of roots, you know, I mean, it, it may fail, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, um, as bisection methods, if it meets the initial criteria, it should work. So it, uh, I have the guarantee of the bisection and the speed of Newton. That's the trick, or even faster than Newton with the bisection plus plus. So. Yes? Uh, what assumptions do you make about uh, the continuity of the function and the it has to be continuous. It has to be yeah, continuous. And also, had, have you had a look at, besides finding, uh, finding the root of a function, uh, finding the maximum and minimum value over well, an interval? Well, you can do that by uh, having a look at the root for the slope, not the function. Yeah, itself. but the slope may not exist. Well, okay, then you have to use other, other techniques. But I mean, but there's a there's a I've seen as I've seen published uh, uh, something. It's similar to bisection, but they 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 divide the interval by the golden ratio. Have you you know what I'm talking? Oh, okay, about? yes, yeah. Golden ratio methods. Yeah, these are uh, uh, univariable optimization methods. Yeah. But you can use Newton uh, if it's a smooth function uh, to find the zero of the slope. So you're basically uh, working with the with the slope and probably the second derivative if you're doing the derivative of the slope. So, uh -huh. uh, what if your function has multiple roots between A and B? Is there any sensitivity? Oh, within A and B, uh, <laughs> that's why it's good to plot these functions. Now, with, before it used to be plotting was a pain in the neck. Now it is you can't. Yeah. Uh, then you are at the mercy of how the iteration uh, progresses here. Yeah. Uh, will, but will bisection work if you start with a, the initial endpoint where you have inflections in between? Can it handle it? Uh, you mean like saddle points? Yeah, like if, you, if your initial endpoints is if there's multiple inflections in between, you're going to find one of the roots, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You will find, you're guaranteed to find the A root. That's why it's good to, to try to hug the root that you want. And that's why plotting functions helps you. Before, yeah, 40 years ago, uh, plotting was uh, a luxury and uh, it was m more of a, of a guess. That's why the worst method that I devised was basically you start to the left or right of the, and you march, and as you pass the root, you change direction and then you cut your step in half. So you're dancing around the root, it's slower than by section, but it also works. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>